The word mystery is a very interesting word. Think about it just for a little bit longer. The word mystery may be even mysterious within itself. It's used in various ways. I don't know how it is with a lot of young people, but it seems that it goes along with folks who are in their younger years that nothing really is a mystery and we're kind of masters of all things. There are some things that we would call a mystery simply because we don't understand them. And thus this use of it when it comes, that is, that word, when it comes to studying the Bible is even more interesting because it's used in the Bible to usually mean something not yet revealed. So we need to ask the question, what is a mystery as far as our concern in the study of the Bible? Of course, it is something, if it's unrevealed, we can't understand because we need further definition or explanation or, in many cases, further revelation. Something that we, with our limited minds, can't fully grasp until some way or the other, we're more light, more enlightened. You can study all you want to and understand it as well as any human can about heaven, but it's still a mystery. And of course, same thing true about the eternal boat of the wicked, hell. We can say that about the departure of the spirit from the body. James gives as simple an explanation <clears throat> as one can or definition of death when he says the body apart from the spirit is dead. But it's a mystery. I don't know how you are, but this is me right now. But the Bible says, no, this is not just all you. Because you're pointing to your fleshly self. That's your, Paul used it, skene in the Greek. It's your temporary dwelling place. It's a tabernacle, 2 Corinthians 5. It's meant for this world, and this is not a permanent place. Someday you'll move out of it, and that's called death. Now, figure that one. Is there a mystery about death? Well, you study all there is in the Bible. It's possible to know about death, and you'll still find there's a mystery to it. When we go back to the Old Testament and we look, let's say, at uh, one of them that's found in Genesis 41, 25 through 31, and that's where we're down in Egypt. And Pharaoh has had a dream, and you'll remember he dreamed of the fat cattle and the lean cattle. He dreamed of the uh, full ears of corn and the uh, then he, the blasted, as he called it, ears. And he didn't know what was going on. What is meant by this? He could have readily said, it's a mystery to me. But of course, Joseph was there. And Joseph was inspired of the Holy Spirit to make known the dream to him. But not only do that, interpret it appropriately solve that mystery then there is the account over in Daniel 2 27 through 35 of Nebuchadnezzar's dream and all of those soothsayers and magicians and whatever that all of the courts of the realm whatever kingdom had them supposedly so they could read the minds of the gods of the future or something none of those fellows could reveal the mystery but Daniel was able to do so because the same Holy Spirit was in him to guide him that was in Joseph. And thus it was made known, again, reminding him what he dreamed and then interpreting the, the dream. 
Daniel 2, 27 through 35. And again, we can say, mystery solved. But we come later in Daniel's life when he's an old man. And we have another mystery presented in chapter 5, verses 25 through 29. And that is where Belshazzar saw the handwriting on the wall of the palace in Babylon. And that, of course, astounded him and frightened him. But he didn't know what it meant. A finger appeared and wrote on the wall, Min name, Min name, clue Farsin. And that took then Daniel coming to say, here's what that meant. Of course, it applied to the king, that kingdom. Thou art weighed in the balances and found warning. And that night, his kingdom was destroyed and overthrown. Mystery solved. Then we come down to the last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. John the Apostle is exiled on Patmos, and he saw a vision. In fact, he saw a number of visions for what was over with. You can see those in the book of Revelation. And I've always found it interesting that the book of Revelation is difficult and presented as one of the very difficult Bible, uh, Bible books to understand. Yet have you ever noticed uh, what it said in verse 3, right at the beginning of the book, Revelation 1, verse 3? Blessing, a beatitude is, is here. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Obviously, the book was written to the people of that day, and they can understand it, and they were expected to understand it. And when they understood it, they would be blessed in their understanding. So you'll see at the beginning of that book, chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, he sees this picture of candlesticks, lampstands, so there are seven of them. And there is in the midst of those lampstands or candlesticks one like a son of man. And as you start there and go forward, all sorts of things begin to happen. But the thing that we realize is that going back to the beginning is that the Lord revealed to him exactly what was involved in that first picture that he saw. And there were word pictures, highly figurative, full of imagery. But nevertheless, it was revealed. This does tell us that even in the scriptures, as Paul said to the Ephesians, uh, when you read what I wrote, you'll understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. But there are some things, according to Peter, referring to Paul's writings, that are more difficult to understand and thus not impossible to understand but more difficult to understand. And thus, much more is involved when it comes to our studying the Scriptures. But now I just simply give those, three from the Old Testament, one from the New, as to an example of the meaning of the word mystery as it is used by the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Now, I said all of that to get back down to what we find by Paul's writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And we are very familiar with verse 15, where Paul says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. But then he launches into one, and without controversy, great is the mystery, is our word. Mystery of godliness. Godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in the glory. I would like for us to look at that for a moment. Because the Holy Spirit had Paul, a great apostle, say to the young preacher Timothy, Great is the mystery of godliness. First of all, notice God was manifest in the flesh. When we say God, capital G-O-D, 
we are referring to the one eternal divine essence that inhabits eternity without beginning or ending, made up of three persons. Now that within itself is hard for our minds to grasp, but that's exactly what we have. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God, Father of all, one spirit, Paul writes. Not three individual gods, but one God, the triune type existence. Again, great is that mystery. And I don't know when we all get to heaven and a glorified body in the shadows of this world have been swept away if we'll ever understand God because of just who he is. But he's talking about here what we can know. Manifest in the flesh. Deity chose to become a human without giving up his deity. How did that one singular deity choose to become a human? By one of the Godhead three, the second person of the Godhead, becoming flesh, as John said, dwelling among us. So he became a human. John 1, 1 through 14. You have to go back to the beginning of the chapter to see in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And you might want to read it this way. In the beginning was the Lagos. That's what it says. Of all, that, that's a rich word right there. In the beginning was the word Lagos, from which we get logic. Can you conceive of God not being flawless logically? And he will say in his dealings with man, because of the way he made man, in persuading men to come back to him and recognize his truth, come let us reason together. So God made us to be able to reason with, and he got on our level and reasoned with us. So God, the Logos, in the beginning was the Logos. And then he tells us that the Logos was God and with God. That the Logos, the Word, was with the one divine essence and was of the one divine essence. And that's the person of the Godhead that became flesh. And we know that the second person of the Godhead is the executor of the Father's will. We learn a little bit about God there. All authority inheres in the first person of the Father. The second person is always pictured as the executor of the Father's will. And the third person of the Holy Spirit is always pictured as the arranger and the one who puts all things in order. And you say, well, why must it be that way? Why even raise such a question? If it was some other way, would you say, why must it be that way? Or if it was some other way from the first two, would you still say, why must it be that way? Sort of like people already here on earth saying, I just don't know why God put me here. Why could he have done it another way? That is silly because you're here. You're a matter of fact. Now, what are you going to do about you being here? Wish you weren't. So God, in the person of Jesus, was made flesh. And John says he dwelt among us. If you read 1 John 1, he'll say, he's just as real a human being as I am or you are anybody else. We've touched him. We've seen him. We've felt him. And Isaiah, 700 or more years before Jesus walked this earth, declared another mystery. We mentioned it this morning, that a virgin would conceive and bear a son, and call his name Emmanuel, God with us, Isaiah 7, 14. Isn't that amazing? God with us. In a way that he wasn't before he tabernacled in the flesh. That ought to be able to tell us something if we desire to think on it a while. And you'll remember, too, that Philip would say in his earthly ministry to Jesus, Show us the Father, and it spieth us. He would say, Have I been so long with you? I've often thought about that question. Have I, Christ, been so long with you or the apostles? Which tends to imply that haven't you been thinking about me and what I do and what I say? And 
Doesn't that imply to you something? I know it did at least to Peter. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood had not revealed it unto thee. You didn't learn this from men. All right, if he didn't learn it from men, where'd he get it? But my father. Well, how did his father show Peter that Jesus Christ was his only begotten son, and God in the flesh? Have you ever read John 20, 30, and 31? And many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his apostles, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing have life in his name. What did Peter see from the Father that Jesus could say showed to him what flesh and blood didn't and revealed a mystery? That is that Jesus Christ had the signs, miraculous signs, that when he worked them it says, I am God in the flesh. So Philip would be asked by Christ, he that are told by Christ, he that has seen me hath seen the Father, John 14, 9. Had nothing to do with flesh and blood. Has to do with attitudes and fruit borne out in the life of Christ. The miracles worked in the life of Christ by him and the prophecies fulfilled and that he kept the law perfectly. These things could be beheld by all and thus mystery solved. But he also said, that is Paul did to Timothy, that Jesus was justified in the Spirit. The Bible says that Jesus received the Spirit without measure. Well, back when he was in the form of God, first, second, third person of the Godhead, there was no reason to have to receive any kind of extra help as that person because as they all worked in the form of God in eternity, they were beyond any kind of temptation because God can't be tempted of evil, to do evil, according to James. But he needed, once he tabernacled in the flesh, having left the form of deity, whatever that is, to be able to prove I am who I claim to be. And I just gave you John 20, 30, and 31, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, full of material that shows that he worked miracles proving himself to be God in the flesh. So the Holy Spirit bore witness to the fact that he was all that he claimed to be. And then you had the instant at our Lord's baptism. Remember, John was preparing the Jews to receive the Christ, get ready for the kingdom, and he preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, they were already in covenant relationship with God because they were born Jews, but they weren't living like the law Moses said, Moses said, so John told them, repent. That is, get ready. Get your life straightened out according to the law. If you're not living it, live it. And you will be able to receive the Messiah. Well, Jesus came. John didn't want to baptize Jesus. He said, I need to be baptized of you. Jesus said, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. I'm a Jew in the flesh. This commandment is to the Jews. I'm going to obey the commandment. He didn't need remission of sins. Mark 1, 4. He needed to repent. He did it because it was a commandment that God gave to the Jews, and he was a Jew, so he obeyed it. And have you ever noticed, right after that happened, the heavens were opened, and they saw the Spirit of God, and he saw the Spirit of God, descending like a dove. Appeared as a dove, wasn't a dove, it was the Holy Spirit. And actually lighting upon the person or the body of Jesus. And then, lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. Now, if you'd been standing there beholding all of that, I really don't know how to describe the impact it would have had upon you. But that was all done. So we can understand that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be. We don't understand a lot of things this day. I don't understand how apostles could just say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Not by any power they had as a human being. But then God through them raised that person up. Don't know what it would be like to experience that. But I believe. 
Because the Word of God, which can be proven to be the Word of God, declares such to be so as it does in all these things. So he justified in the Spirit, Paul said. But he also seen of angels. You remember all through Christ's days, we learned a little bit something about angels. That they were at his birth, and speaking there at his birth, about his birth, Luke 2, 13 through 14. And as you go on into his temptation, Mark, Matthew 4, verse 11, the angels minister to him following his temptation. In Luke 22 and verse 43, as he was under the agony of the Garden of Gethsemane, he was strengthened by angels in the garden. And after he had died, been buried, and was raised from the dead, the angels announced his resurrection. Matthew 23, 6. And lo and behold, in Acts 1, verses 10 through 11, as he's talking with his disciples, a cloud comes down, and with the clouds he goes up and receives Christ out of their sight. The angels stand by, all of a sudden, there they are. Say, so why are you standing here, staring up into heaven? This same Jesus whom you've seen going to heaven in like manner will come. So we are able to see that he was seen of angels and he was preached unto the Gentiles. Paul wrote that the Gentiles were to be fellow heirs with the Jews in the blessings of the great gospel of Jesus Christ, God's power to save men from sin. Ephesians 3, 6, Romans 1, 16. The mystery of how God would save man had been hidden throughout the ages. And the third person of the Godhead, the great revealer and organizer, through the preaching of the apostles, reveals in the New Testament of Christ that can only be found through the teaching of the New Testament of Christ, all about Christ and how he saves, what's all involved in that process. Then Paul said, believed on in the world. Well, countless millions have believed that mysterious story of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. A fellow by the name of, at least I found this interesting, Edward Carmack, in a lecture he gave on character, said, and I quote, on the hypothesis that Jesus was only a man would have been a greater miracle than the virgin birth. In other words, the idea is if you say, well, Jesus was only a man, what do you do about all these other things? How do you explain those things? Then it says he was received up into glory. Well, that's kind of mysterious to me. In fact, it's quite mysterious. But these things impact us as mere mortals. They were designed to do that. They were designed to say, God is not like a man. And even when he became a man to come here on earth and be tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin and sacrifice his body on the cross, and on that same cross shed his blood for the remission of our sins. Come down from the cross, be buried in the tomb, and raised to walk alive on this earth again. Then to be received up into glory. All of that is designed to impress people. I hear a lot today about folks trying to impress other folks. How can anybody read this material and say, doesn't impress me. But here's what impresses me. Multiplied millions and millions of years ago, there was a mud hole and it bubbled around. And over chance, thousands of years, some slimy thing crawled out of it. Isn't that amazing? No rhyme, no reason, no design, no logic involved. But even in all this mystery here about Christ, there's a logic involved. Because you begin with God. And God operates decently and in order. 
And God did that which was only necessary to do in order to save man. Well, as I say, the tinge of this mystery runs throughout the Bible. You can see it in the creation of the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1. Bringing in the flood of waters upon the ungodly, Genesis 7. The opening of the Red Sea for the children of Israel to go through on dry ground. In anticipation that it was a shadow of baptism. Because as they went through, there was water on both sides and a cloud that covered them. Paul would say much later on that it was a figure like baptism. Because they were forever separated from those in, who held them in bondage. They were set free from that. It's true afterward that they came out, that they didn't live as they ought to. But see how it tells the story in figure and type and shadow that is told plainly in words of the New Testament. You have also the fact that as they came to go into the land of promise, the, land, the river Jordan, how as soon as the priest with the Ark of the Covenant souls touched the feet of that water, stopped on one side and ran off on the other, and they walked across on dry ground. Why is that in your Bible? Is that not astounding? It's a mystery, surely, as to how all that works. And the only way you can answer this mystery is say God's behind every bit of it. That's the only way it works. You had back there and sun staying about three hours, not shining, veiled in midnight darkness, we might say, at the death of Jesus Christ, Matthew 27, 45. There's one song that says, when the mighty maker died, the sun refused to shine. That's a sight. What an astounding thing. The Israelites were healed when they looked upon the brazen serpent. Numbers 21.8. That ought to make us stop and think. No power in the brass or serpent or pole. The power was in their faith in God that he would cure them when they looked on that serpent. And then an amazing thing, quite a mystery, Jonah, three days and three nights in the great fish's belly, he kept him alive. Stomach acid hadn't worked on him at all. So much so that when he vomited him up on the shore, he said, well, I guess I better go do what I was told to do in the first place. And I guess that's a pretty good thing to emphasize because a lot of us have to be thumped on the head a few times to get us to do what we already knew in the first place. And as we go through life, God bearing with us and long-suffering toward us to get us to have time to obey Him. Uh, there's a lot of folks have a lot more knots on their head before they decide to turn, and some never turn. Some never realize the value of it all. When you look at the creation or in nature, it's filled with mysteries. And you know, we don't reject those because they're mysterious. Now, what I've given you thus far, a lot of people say it never happened, never happened. Well, they live in a world all around them every day that's full of all sorts of mysteries. Do we think science has discovered everything that's in this world already? And look what's been discovered since 1900. Look what's been discovered since World War II. Look what's been discovered since 1960. And everybody was turning right along, not realizing there are things here unrevealed. Of course, people think they're going to be able to find a cure for cancer. Maybe they can. They think they can. It's a mystery, but they keep trying to discover it. And so many, many other things that today in medicine we benefit from because somebody kept looking. It was there. Now, it doesn't seem to bother people that we live in a world where so many things have not been found. But come to the Bible, we read of all these things I've been mentioning, and people say, oh, that's just a bunch of stuff. But you take a dried up kernel of corn, you put it in the ground where it's moist enough, and that thing with the germ of life will come up and look completely different from that thing you put in the ground. See that every time. And you know, to this day, Nobody knows what that germ of life is. Nobody can explain that. 
It's a mystery. Now, you take a caterpillar and it turns into a moth or it turns into a butterfly. Even that process, quite a mystery. All sorts of things, and we function right along. But when it comes to these things in the infallible Word of God that comes to us down through the ages as God unfolds how He's going to save man from the greatest enemy man has, sin. And people say, well, I, I, I don't understand the virgin birth of Christ. That's a mystery to me. I don't understand death, how the spirit can leave the body and still be you and the body be left to go back to the dust from which it came. But know this, God knows. That's the thing of it. Whether he reveals it or not, that's another story. But God knows. He's in complete control. There's not anything that he doesn't control. Even Satan, as he works now to cause us to sin and die in sin and lose our souls, fits into the divine scheme of things. And I'll give you this example. You know it. Back in Genesis 3, and verse 15, the first vague prediction of one to save man, the old serpent, the bruise of the heel of the seed of woman, but the seed of woman bruise the head of Satan. Well, Satan was involved back there. He didn't know what that meant. Satan's supernatural. He's a supernatural being, but he's not God. He's not omniscient. He doesn't have an eternity. He didn't understand what that meant. And so when Christ finally comes to earth all those years later in the fullness of time, Galatians 4, 4, 4 and finally he causes men, wicked men, to put to death Christ. He must have thought, I've done it. I've ended it. But he hadn't. And so if we will put our trust in what the Bible says about Christ and do our duty to God as the Bible presents it, there's no mystery to it in this sense. However God works it, if I'm faithful to him, you will come through. Be thou faithful unto death. And I will give thee a crown of life. Crown of life. John says if we don't know what we'll be like, we will be like him when we see him as he is. That's astounding. What will it be like to possess a glorified, resurrected human body that's like the one Christ now has? Kind of a mystery, isn't it? John Mason said, if we love the Bible as we ought, it is dearer to us than life, nearer to us than our relations, sweeter to us than our liberty, and more pleasant than any earthly comforts. All arguments against the word of God are fallacious. All conceits against it delusions. All derisions against it blasphemies. And all oppositions against it madness." Unquote. Let's love the Bible because it's God's word and given to us. It's given to us. If no humans on this earth, there wouldn't be a Bible. God gave that Bible to us for our benefit. And thus we close with this old poem from Sir Walter Scott. Within this ample volume lies the mystery of mysteries. Happiest they of human race to whom God has given grace to read, to fear, to hope, to pray, to lift the latch, to force the way. And better had they ne'er been born who read to doubt and read to scorn. So we sow the seed of the kingdom. And wherever it falls, it lands in the heart of good and honest people. Luke 8, 15. It will germinate and bring forth fruit. And great is the mystery that it does. But it's as true as if I plant that corn, and I don't know about that germ of life, but I expect it to come up, because God will take care of it. And such is the same way with the Word. It will not return void, but will accomplish whereunto He sent it. If you need to obey the Gospel, I can't think of a better time, because this is the only time really you are sure of. To believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, 
repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. As a child of God, renew your strength and the trust in God based upon the words of God. To he who holds the key to all mysteries, repent of your sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. If you're subject to the gospel invitation, we bid you come while we stand and while we sing.